when you retire, normally there's some VIP up here, and I'm standing in for the VIP, and you get a bunch of certificates. You know, one says congratulations, you know, you made it to the end, blah, blah, blah. And then you get another one that says congratulations, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you made it to the end. But along with those certificates of retirement and all that stuff, they do, the Army does print up a certificate for your wife or whoever you're married to in this generation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so anyway. So this is a certificate from the Army. Come on up, come on up here, honey. You. <laughs> so, the certificate reads, Certificate of Appreciation right? to all who shall see these presence greetings is to certify that Karen Dvorak put up with 24, 20 years, <laughs> 4 months, and 3 days of Peter being away on this occasion of the retirement of your spouse from the United States Army. As in grateful appreciation for your own unselfishness, faithful, and devoted service. Your unfailing support and understanding Help to make possible your spouse's lasting contribution to the nation. So I love you, baby. Oh. 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 process of packing all this stuff up, Karen, you know, starting to get emotional because we started talking about wills and all this stuff, and she puts a big hug, she puts a big hug on me and says, why do you have to go? And I said, because people have got to go to defend freedom, okay? And that's not a pat on my back, I just want to know how much Karen loved me because she was concerned about me going. But she was very, very supportive in all the places that I went, I went to, I went back to Iraq in uh, 07 and worked uh, detention operations. The task force 134 and then I came back uh, led a field support team in Afghanistan to conduct information and influence operations over there but every time I left great people like Tommy Campbell her brother-in-law made sure that um, things were taken care of on the ranch whatever care needed help he would come over the reason why I share that with you is because um, there are people back here in the United States that support us and we have to recognize what they do do for us it could be a brother-in-law, it could be a sister, it doesn't make any difference, people working at the restaurants, whatever the case might be. But there are people back here that we have to honor because they're supporting us while we're over there fighting for freedom, okay? And so I just want to say thanks, honey, for all the support you gave me when I was away. So um, with that said, she's got a presentation. Um, uh, and so I'm going to stumble through this song <laughs> as best I can. But this is a song from Orleans that I'm dedicating to my honey. Aww. Aww. Can, can you turn it up a little bit more, George? Yeah. This is about it. I know. <laughs> I can't find it. <laughs> no, no, that's not it either. He'll eventually get there. I'll pay him. He'll get there. Yeah, that's not good. Just some technical that? difficulties. Yeah. What's that? Just some technical difficulties. That's okay. Well, while George is working out the intricacies, I'll, I'll share with you, for those that you haven't been overseas, and for all of you that haven't What's been that? able to sit down and look enemy in the face, I had an opportunity to do that when I was at Task Force 134, and I share this with you because you need to understand the enemy that we face today. Um, when people were rolled up on the battlefield, basically what happened is and when the surge went in Iraq, um, General Petraeus, Put the forces out of places like um, Anbar province. Give me just a second. And the uh, ground forces, Marines, Army went out there and they said, if you're 15 years and older, get on the truck. And they shipped them off to Camp Cropper. Camp Cropper was the processing place in which all the detainees came in and they were processed for medical, dental, make sure they were healthy, get vaccines and all these things. They eventually were shipped down to Camp Cropper, which was uh, 20,000 people down to give or take. Um, the significant thing that happened when General Stone was involved in detention operations was 
he was able to take over Task Force 134 earlier in uh, 2007 and turned it from a kinetic environment down in Buka, which were basically they were controlling those people with water cannons and shields and tear gas to a peaceful environment in which uh, they, during the time that I was there they let about 8,000 people go and of, eight, of, the, of those 8,000 General Stone's program of teaching them skills and as such was such a great success that only seven of them returned to the battlefield. This was quite an accomplishment for General Stone. And um, he eventually took that program and introduced it to countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and Jordan. They mirrored that um, success in there. But what was interesting is when they would bring those individuals into Camp Cropper, they were broken down into Sunni, Shia, and Takfiri. If you don't understand the tech free mindset is, I just want to kill you. I don't care that you're black, white, Japanese, Oriental, don't make a difference. I just want to kill you because you're an American. That's the truth. So there would come a time when detainees would rotate. Every six months, they would get an opportunity to plead their case for release. And we had this thing called the Minfric Board. And the Minfric Board was a chance where the detainee would sit across from three officers, not, not across the table, but obviously back some, because I'd hate to have to strangle one of those guys when they came after me. But in the end, um, and they would plead their case to be released, and most of the times, depending on the intelligence that we had, we would agree to release them. But when the guys would get rolled up, and they would claim to be attack fury, this is when they got rolled up on the battlefield, and the division guys wouldn't argue with me, they'd just say, okay, fine, 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 you're attack fury, you're attack fury, just get on the truck. So when they came into Cropper, we identified them whether they were Sunni, Shia, or Takfiri. And then eventually they got shipped down to Cropper, I mean, uh, down to Buka. Well, the interesting thing is, this is when the truth came out, okay? And the truth was, okay, all the Sunnis, go over there to that compound. They were in thousand-man compounds. All the Shia, go to this compound over here. All the Takfiris, which were very few, go over here. But... The instant a man that went into the Takfiri compound, if he didn't know the code of the Takfiri, 15 seconds later, I'm making an exaggeration of time, but he was literally begging to get let out of that compound because they knew that he was not a true Takfiri. But those, whenever those, one of those Takfiri guys, and they still, even though we knew what their intent was, they still were able to come up and plead their case. But here is a conversation that went on between the three officers or three NCOs who were on the Minfric board and the Tag Fury. And we had, of course, we had a translator, and the translator would say, okay, um, I plead your case to be released. And this is the response we would get from the Tag Fury. He just wanted to reach across as fast as he could and kill us because we were in Americans. He didn't care any other reason. Of course, those folks never got released. But in the end, you know, we had a, General Stone had a very successful um, uh, detention program in which many of those folks got released and um, and they went back into back to their families and lived a uh, lived the life that they were uh, pulled from. Anyway, all right. And how loud is it going to be? Is it going to be a, a loud enough for me to hear up here? Oh, there you go. Ready, baby? We. I was too old.